So, good morning guys. Today I'm going to show you the latest update of our connector. Um, it's going to be an Arduino Extra Fagenza. You might think to yourself, why? Let's show you why. Because we have this productivity controller. And why do we need that right now? It's an Arduino Micro, by the way. Pro Micro. Because we can switch. We can switch between scenes. So now I can do this. And the throttle should be increasing. Right now the game is stuck, so nothing is increasing at all. Oh, here we go. It's increasing. <laughs> and then we can switch back. Take off the parking brakes, you know, always a good plan. We have our test bench with a servo hooked up. I'm going to show you in the end how you can connect external power, like um, an adapter to it. All right now I'm a bit swerving because I'm talking and flying at the same time, but whatever. Um, we got our toggle box connected and just because I had to get the Arduino count up I also connected the sub counter so we have an Arduino Pro Micro, we have an Arduino Mega, we have an Arduino Pro Micro again, an ESP 2866, 8266 I believe it is, it's a Wi-Fi board, it's a small but quite powerful microcontroller and we have our um, Nano for the throttle. So all in all <laughs> If you can't get enough, this is it. Um, so right now we have um, gears are down, so we're gonna race them. As we already, perhaps if you seen the previous video, these lights should be going off. So that's working fine. If I lower it again, because why not? You know, air safety, FEA regulations out of the window. The lights go on. Now let me zoom in on the LCD screen and I believe it becomes more readable as well. Here we go. Let's position that a little bit better. Move this a bit. Move this a bit. There we go. Make sure that they don't crash. Um, we can see that we have some data going on right here. We have something over here, which is... If I'm correct... Ah, okay. I got my autopilot on, apparently. But it's adjusting the rudder. This is the elevator trim, I believe. And let's just take a quick look at the code to see. Um, let's take a quick look. We can see that on the first part, that what is changing is the elevator trim percentage. So it's this value, if I'm correct. There's a bit of a rounding difference sometimes, so I need to look into that. So even though in reality the values are almost the same, they can differ by 1% depending on the rounding. <laughs> We've got the servo hooked up, which does that. Let's, let's increase flaps. Let's increase it even more. And it's 100%. Isn't it beautiful? Look at it. So it represents the angle of the flaps. You can change this to whatever value you like yourself. Um, this was just something because I added it and it was fun to see something move. It's like a gimmick. But you could use it to create the flaps handle. You know the ones in the Cessna, I believe, 172. If you change the flaps, that little dot thingy indicator shows you how far the, along the... Turn of the autopilot. How far along the flaps actually are in reality. Um, we're flying through Italy right now. It's going to be around a 10 minutes flight. Um, let's try to lower the throttle a little bit. Here we go. Perfect. No, not really, but we'll do. The gears are up. So what else do we have? Let's just, let's engage the, let's do autopilot with the altitude mode on. Altitude holds, heading selects, and let's turn it on. Here we go. Just to make it easier so I can show you guys some things. Um, heading, current heading. Let's increase it a bit to the left. Come on. Um, so that's going to fly itself, I hope. Let's show you. Here we go. We have the flaps. There are all these values. Flaps handles, flaps handle indexes, edge left. Edge right, percentage angle, and the angle is going to be in degrees. Um, so it's going to be 3 degrees, 4 degrees. It will correspond to the flaps value you see 
underneath here. It's important to note that it depends on which plane you're flying to which flaps correspond to the flaps you see in the bottom right corner when you're in the exterior view. But sometimes it's the trailing edge flaps that get shown there and sometimes it's the leading edge flaps because if you multiple if you have a plane with multiple flaps set up it will also differ the values you receive depending on which flaps you select. So that's something to just keep in mind. Um, it's normal behavior but I don't know it's not that you think okay mine says 14 while in here it says 20 could be that there are the different flaps in the plane. The gear values, the position, position of the handle, hydraulic pressure. This plane doesn't have it because else it would be up right here. Um, the tail position, arc position, total position. If you just want one value to see how far along it is, and the rudder and trim, and the same as with the flaps, either in angle or either in the position uh, percentage. Sorry. So that is quite some data that's now available. Let's disable the other pilot or else it's going to crash into this mountain. Um, so the data has grown. It's all up to you to use however you'd like. Right now I did notice that currently my approach is to always make a string. Because I had that approach in the beginning when I only handled... Uh, let's get this out of the way. The frequencies because you had to have 1.4.850 or 124.850. Um, so you had to append A, append B, add a dot in the middle to get the, you know, the, the right correct way to display the um, frequency. And I always kept that same approach. So right now, if you want to do some calculations, we have to do dot to int, which also means that um, sometimes that's not necessary because the percentage of gears of the gear lowered is something that we can just store as an int because. You know, then you can automatically execute the calculations while you still maintain. If you print an int, it will also work fine. So that's something that is coming up um, in the coming weeks, week perhaps even. Next week, I mainly want to focus as well to get the input connector merged into the connector. And that's just because um, it's going to make it easier for you guys that you don't need two applications running gonna make it easier for me to maintain in one place so that's coming up as well um what else is coming up because <laughs> there is so much that's possible that you know it's sometimes gets a bit overwhelming and uh, not not really but you know it, it, it's a lot that still has to be done and uh, there is a lot that we already have done so um what's coming up as well is warnings and cautions somebody asked about that and that's um like these warnings, it's in the Garmin G1000. Right now it says pitted heat off. The SDK has no trigger for which warning gets sent, but it does send the data. Now what I've been doing is collecting manuals of several planes that are in game that were available. I still need to look up more, etc., to see if they contained the literal definition of the warnings. So let's say um, cabin pressure, etc. too low. I believe I found a 737 mentioned somewhere and at which thresholds it will trigger the alarm. So even though it doesn't pass the caution, we know that if the alarm and the 747, 737, I don't know, gets triggered at a certain point, we know that if that data gets below that point, we should trigger a warning. Fair, right? So that's a principle that I have to apply. Now you might already <laughs> guess that it's going to be taking, it's going to take quite some research, could take quite some time, quite some reading, quite some programming. Um, so that's coming up later on. I first want the data to be in. That's all needed for those cautions as well. Need to test that, make sure that's stable, or else you will have warnings going off on your screen while you don't have in game, and that's something we want to avoid. So um, expect that to coming up a little further down the road. So don't expect that next week or tomorrow. Um, don't get your hopes up that high that we'll get this soon. Um, it's going to take a bit of time, especially because now um, I work as a support engine, a support technical support for something in the event industry normally as my job. But due to COVID um, in January, I'm about to lose my job. So I'm going to be spending a bit more time searching for a new one. So either if that succeeds, it's going to be a little bit less of this 
Um, my time is going to be take. It's going to be take. Ugh, I can't get out of my words. I'm going to take a little less of my time into this, and I need to find a job because bills have to, have to be paid, right? Um, it's going to be a bit harder because I'm one of those types. Stay in school, kids. I dropped out, and um, it, is, it doesn't make it easier. <laughs> so um, let's get back on track. This is. I love to do this, so don't be afraid that I will abandon this because. I love to do it. I love to make something that you guys actually apparently like using. Um, so that is all fine. I'm gonna keep working on it. It just depends on how the job hunt goes, right? So we are approaching our destination, I believe. I believe it's straight ahead. I did a test flight before this, well, not a test flight. I actually recorded it. And then I noticed that I had the sound of the webcam on as well, so it were two audio streams coming in simultaneously and I had to do it all over, but that's just, uh, that's the nature of the game, right? You make some mistakes. Eight nautical miles, so I believe it's up straight ahead, if I'm correct. Like I said, it's the southern part of Italy, never been there, so it looks Italian to me. <laughs> Already lose some speed, right? Yeah, we're going pretty fast. So you can see the servo going up again, the value going up. Let's lower our throttle and make a little bit of a turn and set in the descent. Last time I got lost here as well, and I overshot the airport, but. It's all the way over there. Yeah, it should be. I don't gonna wanna be coming in from the ocean side. Wind is coming from north up seven knots, so that's it's doable for me as a rookie, you know. And one thing that I also have coming up is right now I'm using the Xbox controller, but that's just it. It works, but uh, you know, if I, especially if I have to flip the switches, handle the throttle, and still have my whole hands on the controller, rudder trims during takeoff. So you have one hand on the throttle, the other finger is using the rudder with the triggers, which just flap the thing around like crazy. And you can't switch between sides, so left between right, because you need to actually move your hands. Um, so that's something I'm going to be looking at making a joystick. I used to be really into uh, farm sim. I know, right? <laughs> Farming simulator, why not? But I bought that Satec um, control panel. It's for. It was made for farm sim specifically. Let's see if I can get this yet. It has a little joystick up front, which has. Uh, it wasn't. I took this apart because I'm going to show you in a video anyway, um, to see how a real manufacturer, because it's Logitech makes hardware and it, I was actually surprised that the joystick is just two potentiometers <laughs> with some movement uh, mechanisms in between. So that's something I'm going to be looking at if I can convert this into a working flight sim controller just as there was a... here it is. Oh, let's try if I can get it close enough to, for you to see. This is a uh, Potentiometer. No, it isn't. It's a rotary encoder, but it's a, like a closed system. You stick something in and then you turn And that's the way it recognizes it. So It has a little little wheel in the middle. You can't really see it But if you stick something in because it's a hexagon kind of no, octagon, I think So you stick the thing in and start rotating it and that's how you increment or decrease the steps and I think that's a genius approach to a rotary encoder so I'm going to try to hook this up as well for something like the trim or something else for data let's get my head out of the way okay so the approach is over there see I haven't been paying attention at all so no clue where I am Yeah, here we 
we've got. We're almost at our destination. Let's raise it a little bit. I don't want to land in the sea red. Right, right, right. And I think it was a perfect small distance flight, you know. Don't want to hold you up for an hour. Got to enjoy the Mediterranean Sea a bit, you know. Seems like it's decent weather. If I look outside, it's raining, so that's why I didn't choose to depart from Schiphol as I usually do. Okay, got it coming up. Lower the throttle a bit. No, 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 here we go, sorry. Raise the flaps. Lose more speed. Lower the gear, here we go. Whoa. So the lights are working. And I always fly offline when I'm testing stuff just to, you know, I want to ensure that I don't bother people with my erratic flying behavior when I'm testing things, especially if I really test something and sometimes I just spend all day departing, landing, departing, landing, and then holding it still in the air with slew modes to test the parameters, etc. Um, so I always make sure that I'm not in an active uh, environment and life plays off because I know that some of you are a bit more into the realism than me. Um, so, you know, I want to leave the space to you. Oh, this is a terrible landing. Oh, it's fine. Oh, boy. Oh. Could be worse, could be better, right? Let's lower the throttle. And get back to the track. So that's the updates that we, that I want to discuss today. It's going to be up on my website. It's, I'm going to link it in the description as well. Um, if you have any suggestions, if you find any bugs, if you think some data isn't correct, accurate, whatever, let me know. Um, last time I bricked the fuel. Somebody, some of you emailed me and said, Dave, the fuel, I can't get it to work. And I fix it like an hour later. So um, if you report it, I will look into it. If you like it, leave a like. And if you keep updated, subscribe. And I hope to see you in the next one. And have fun flying. So I almost forgot, but I was supposed to show you how I hooked up the external power source to my servo. Well, first of all, we have a 12 volt adapter coming in. Now the thing is, I need 5 volts. And I would say, why don't you buy a 5 volt adapter? Well, I could, but I don't have one laying around. And I do have a 12 volt one laying around. Um, so I picked that one up. So it goes into one of these connectors. Um, these can just be, let's see if I have one laying around, I think. Oh, um, let's see. Let's see. They are a couple cents each, so they don't set you back that much. It has a, let's see. Yeah, you're able to tell right that it's a plus and a minus. So it's important to have it match. So plus is the red one, black is the black one. And over here, we have a bug converter. This little fella, let's try to zoom in. Change the camera angle, here you go. This little fella will convert the 12 volt coming in to five volts going out. Now it doesn't do it instantly or automatically, what you need to do is to get a multimeter. See if I can. Now, whoops, yeah, got one over here. Nice and big on screen. Let's turn it on. So it says no current, which is obvious because I don't have anything hooked up, right? So I'm gonna put the black one on the negative outputs and the red one on the positive. 
And we should be able to see that it's 1.4. That's not correct, right? Come on. Let's get it in there like that. And I go over here. Yeah, perfect. I think I see something, right? A little weird angle. It's 4.475 actually. Um, so what you can do in that case is turn it a little bit to the right. There's a little, let's see, see that little, little, little screw up here. If I tighten it, it will go up. If I loosen it, so to the left, it will go down, the voltage output. So let me check once again. So it always just check in between turning to see you can get a feel about how much it turns for each. Oh, let's get it back in screen again. Four point five six, which is fine by me. You know, I don't want it to be pinpoint perfect. As long as it isn't too much over the five volts, it's fine. Um. So once you have that hooked up, I got it soldered though, because I. Please, if you take anything away from this, be careful, you know. Um, plus, mine is don't let it touch. Same goes for this side. Don't let it touch, you get a short. Same for that side. Don't touch, you get a short. Don't grab it with the plus and the minus, like, with your hands, because it's going to hurt, perhaps even badly. So just be careful when handling life power. If you want to move this around, perhaps create an enclosure for it. Um, I've got it. I'm just going to show you for a sec, because, you know, why not? See that little red box? That's a bug converter as well, which powers my Arduino, I uh, know, Raspberry Pi from my Ender 3 power supply. So, I got an enclosure so I can touch it. It isn't open and loose. Nobody can touch the cables. I'm not afraid that my girlfriend is going to walk in and hurt herself by something I made. So if you want to use this, create, put it away somewhere safe, I think. And then I went to the breadboard with the power output. And I just connected the power and ground to the external power. And the you know, the control pin just to the board. Now it's important that you connect the ground from the external power source and your board. If you don't do this, I think I can show you if I take out this wire so the grounds aren't connected together, you can hear the servo going crazy. So it's always important to keep, uh, keep it all connected over a single ground wire, or perhaps you can have multiple, but as long as one ground line is connected to all the devices okay so that is how you implement the external power source